Um, so today we're going to pivot into, so this is day two of the kind of four day setup for talking um, about sort of just general terminology and getting us um, familiar, um, getting us some backbone for what we're going to do going forward. Today, we're going to talk about randomization. Um, what do I mean by that? We're going to really be thinking about experimental design. Um, what do we mean? There's this, this title is kind of a work in progress, but we're thinking about experiments, kind of non-experimental settings, observational settings, and thinking about um, Fisherian randomization and how that can be useful in design-based inference. So we'll kind of talk about two parts. Uh, one part is gonna be talking about debates uh, around the value of randomization, both historically and current. So we're gonna go back in the past a little bit. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about some more recent um, kerfuffles on this topic. And then we're going to talk about the idea of a research design and more generally this concept of design-based inference. So design-based inference is something I think you will have been less familiar to you. It's not something that um, typically gets taught in a lot of um, econometrics or statistics courses or econometrics courses. And I'm going to sort of lay the groundwork for it. It's going to be really useful for going forward in the future um, in our classes. We we're gonna talk about some settings where it's gonna really provide us a useful way of thinking about what is actually the research design and what is kind of the inference that we wanna be doing. And then it'll be more clear um, as we go through it. So let's talk about randomization. So, you know, at the simplest, when we think about randomization, right? I'm thinking of the idea of say we took everyone here in the class we went, had everyone go through, we flipped a coin for every person. We just went down the row, we flipped a coin, heads, you got the treatment, tails, you didn't. You would each be assigned into the treatment and control and be totally random, right? It would be uncorrelated with any of the features um, of, that, of your potential outcomes, right? So there's a, effectively um, a randomized process that generates the intervention. So that's conceptually what we mean formally, and we're gonna come back to this formal definitions here. There's our treatment DI is assigned to a sample N um, such that the set of potential random assignments across all individuals is known. So there's some, there's some omega space, right? Which is the probability distribution of our treatment. In the sense, there's basically the idea being that we have a way in which we think about the probability assignments across individuals, and we know effectively how people are gonna be treated and not. You know, in the simplest version of this, if I flip a coin for everyone, I know what your propensity score is, right? It's 50-50, you either got the treatment or you didn't, and it's uncorrelated with everything else. What's really powerful about randomization, right, is that in these different models of causal inference that we talked about last class, it really kind of does a lot. Randomized intervention, Notably in the in the DAG framework, so in, in Pearl's DAG framework, there's this concept of what's called the, we didn't get into this terminology because I think it's a little overwrought, but there's this concept of the do operator, which the do operator is basically as if I randomly assign D. And when I randomly assign D, so here I'm using a circle to assert it, it's saying that when I manipulate D in a random way, it breaks the paths to all other DAGs. So here, right, before we manipulated it, we had a confounder, right? U is a confounder and we couldn't estimate the effect of D on Y. But once we implement it randomly, that breaks all other connections and we can now identify the effect of D on Y. And intuitively that makes a lot of sense, right? It's, it's hard to identify the effect of D on Y in observational data, but when we see it and we randomly assign it, that makes sense. We know that from our strong ignorability condition it creates independence necessary for strong ignorability. And it creates some forms of independence between the intervention and structural errors in a model. So this is kind of complicated and I'm not gonna put a huge amount of setup on this, but I think it's useful for the economists, us being economists to think about this. And this is a complaint that will come up later when we talk about um, the current debates over randomization is to say, all right, let's say we randomly assign this, right? We randomize an intervention, D, and why would this intervention only affect, create some kinds of independence between D and the structural errors? 
Well, the simplest way to think about this is that, you know, if you think about the effect of D on Y, and so now I have another new DAG because DAGs are compact and easy ways of showing this. Now we have an intervention that affects multiple outcomes. You know, if D affects Y and it affects X through, and then affects Y through X, it starts to be harder to talk about the exclusive effect of D on Y once you like holding fix the effect of X, right? There's this element to which, you know, you have to put more structure on this problem is that if agents re-optimize with respect to X, then you're, you have to sort of do more work in order to get this. Like, agents may potentially re-optimize because of expectations or other things. And so in the, basically randomly assigning something is going to potentially cause still that random assignment may still be correlated with other structural error aspects of your model in the sense that once I give you the treatment, you may do other things and re-optimize in other ways such that you can't just assume that because something is randomly assigned, it's independent of everything that you're interested in. More generally, right, so if I look at the effect of D on Y and I just ran the, the regression of D on Y, I'm not inherently going to get that effect. I'm going to have a back, I'm going to have another causal path as well in this DAG setup. So before we get into it, let me take you, this is, we're going to do some reading while we do this. This was, it was either you had a signed reading or we do it in class. So we're going to do this together because this is really worth reading. This is a very entertaining um, paper. This is on the syllabus. This is this paper called, let's take the con out of econometrics. So briefly as an aside, what I want to do is kind of talk about why randomization is something we're doing now, right? So I'm pushing on you this idea of randomization. We're going to talk about research design. Well, why is that such a big deal? And why is it such a centerpiece of empirical st strategies now? Well, this is a paper from 1983 in the AER. This is based off of a lecture that um, Ed Lemer did, who's, he's, as a setup, he's kind of a character. He writes in a particularly um, uh, vivid way. And so the setup is, you know, he's he, part of, he says, after three decades of churning out estimates, the Econometrics Club finds itself under critical scrutiny and faces incredulity as never before. Fisher Black writes of the trouble with econometric models. David Hendry queries econometrics, alchemy or science. John Pratt and um, Robert Schleifer question our understanding the nature and discovery of structure. And Chris Sims suggests blending macroeconomics and reality. So the state of empirics is bad um, in 1983. So, Lieber then starts to talk about, well, what is it that econometricians would like us to think is going on? Econometricians would like to project the image of agricultural experimenters who divide a farm into a set of smaller plots of land and who randomly assign, who select randomly the level of fertilizer to be used on each plot. If some plots are assigned a certain amount of fertilizer while others assign none, then the difference between the mean yield of the fertilized plots and the mean yield of unfertilized plots is a measure of the effect of the fertilizer on agricultural yields. The econometrician's humble job is only to determine if that difference is large enough to suggest a real effect of fertilizer or so small that it is likely due to random variation. For whatever reason, older econometric stuff is always agriculture related. Lemur goes on to say, this image of the applied econometrician's art is grossly misleading. I would like to suggest a more accurate one. The applied econometrician is like a farmer who notices that the yield is higher under trees where birds roost. And he uses this as evidence that bird droppings increase yields. However, when he presents this finding at the annual meeting of the American Ecological Association, another farmer in the audience objects that he used the same data, but came up with the conclusion that moderate amounts of shades increase yields. A bright chap in the back of the room then observes that these two hypotheses are indistinguishable given the data. He mentions the phrase identification problem, which, though no one knows quite what he means, is said with such authority that it's totally convincing. The meeting reconvenes in the halls and in the bars with a heated discussion on whether this is the kind of work that merits the promotion from associate to full farmer. The luminous strongly opposed to promotion and the aviophiles equally strong in favor. So 
one should not jump to the conclusion is necessarily a substantive difference between drawing inferences from experimental as opposed to non-experimental data. The images I've drawn are deliberately prejudicial. Pre In the first, we had an experimental science scientist with hair neatly combed, wide eyes peering from horn-rimmed glasses, a white coat and electronic calculator generating the random assignment of fertilizer treatment to plots of land in sharp contrast to the non-experimental farmer with overalls unkempt hair and bird droppings on his boots. Another image drawn by Orcutt is even more damaging. Doing econometrics is try like trying to learn the laws of electricity by playing the radio. So that's obviously, you know, what Lemur sets up in this paper and this lecture is the idea that, well, randomization appears to be the answer here. The real difference is that in one place we had randomization and in the other we didn't. We had observ observational data. In the experimental setting, by randomly assigning treatment, um, fertilizer treatment to plots of land, this basically creates a certain amount of basically validity or believability to the to the assumptions. Now he goes on to sort of talk about, you know, randomization doesn't mean you exactly get it right or that it's a perfect mixture of blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just, it really just creates this idea that the L estimator is unbiased, but crucially, his point that he's drawing here is that the sharp distinction between inference from experimental and inference from non-experimental data is that experimental inference sensibly admits a conventional horizon in a critical dimension, namely the choice of explanatory variables. If fertilizer is assigned randomly to plots of land, you really only have to pay attention to the relationship between yield and fertilizer. If you randomly assign something, you're like, okay, this is an effect that I can study because I don't have to worry about confounders, right? This is why that the DAG notation is so valuable. Um, there's only a small risk that when you present things, people will object that there's some sort of confounder that's violating it. In contrast, it's foolhardy to adopt such a uh, limited horizon with non-experimental data. If you choose to include light level in your horizon that is amongst your controls, why not rainfall? And if rainfall, why not temperature? And if temperature, why not soil depth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, his point in this paper is he's going on to sort of describe a number of other ways in which we should deal with this. He's really concerned about this idea that how do we construct things that are valid and sensible and that are basically not sensitive, how do we describe the sensitivity to other assumptions in non-randomized settings? Uh, but, you know, it's really important to kind of highlight this fact that at this time in 1983, the point was is that randomization as emphasized by um, Lemur was one of the few ways that we could actually believe results because of this separation from potential confounders you need to control for. And just to give you another example, this is from Fisher Black. So, you know, Nobel Prize winner Fisher Black. He says, the trouble with econometric models, this is 1982, the trouble with econometric models is they present correlation disguised as causal relations. The more obvious confusions between correlation and causation can often be avoided, but there are many subtle ways to confuse the two. The language of econometrics encourages this confusion. And he goes on. I mean, I'm enjoying reading these because I really feel like they're worth knowing this. But, you know, before I describe sort of how I think the field has answered this, I want you to understand that, obviously, so I'm not that old. I wasn't around for this either. But it's important to kind of understand the historical context for this in the sense that in the 80s, there was really a limited amount of empirical data that was successfully answering things in an applied way that people believed that was credible. And so if you fast forward 25 years later, Angus and Pischke have a very nice um, Journal of Economics Perspective Symposium of which they wrote the lead article where they've declared a credibility revolution. Um, they basically have their, their um, paper is, is called taking the, um, let's take the, uh, what is it? It's taking the con out of econometrics and sort of the, the credibility revolution. And their argument is that research design, 
is the victor with randomization leading the way, the leading champion of this research design approach. Empirical microeconomics has experienced a credibility revolution with consequent increase in policy relevance and scientific impact. Sensitivity analysis played a role in this, but as we see it, the primary engine driving improvement has been the focus on the quality of empirical research designs. This emphasis on research design is in the spirit of the lemur's critique, but did not feature in his remedy. He has this whole remedy that no one uses that it's kind of, is interesting, but um, is sort of very overwrought. The advantages of a good research design are perhaps most easily apparent in research using random assignment, which coincidentally includes some of the most influential microeconometric studies to appear in recent years. So research design is the winner here. So, you know, you're, you're all second year graduate students. This is, I cannot imagine this is the first time that you've heard the expression research design before. Um, you know, I put it in quotes, but so what's the right definition for research design? So it shows up, I, you know, I searched in the document, it shows up 69 times in Angus and Pischke's JEP piece, but they don't define it once, like what it means. And it seems very intuitive to kind of talk about it, but you know, if you Google this or if you try and like get a definition of research design, there's a number of other non-econ or non-statistic settings where it's used, it's sort of a more holistic description, right? It's, it's the approach by which you are doing research. There's a almost a tautological feel to it. What's important in our setting is kind of have a, a vision in mind of what it is. So on the next slide, I'm gonna tell you what I think it is, but I'm curious to, any of you have, a, if you were going to try and describe it, I spent five minutes writing it out. So I know it's not easy to do on the spot, but what would you do? What's your definition of what a research design is? It's that I, so this is Paul Gross and Pinkham's definition of research design, take, you know, caveat emptor. What I'm going to argue is that, so a causal research design is a statistical and or economic statement of how an empirical research paper will estimate the relationship between two or more variables that is causal in nature. So X causing Y. So the design should have a description of how some variation in X is either caused by or approximated by a randomized experiment. So the idea being that, so I think many of the things that you're describing Leland, but I think when you're describing these, um, these assumptions, the statistical ones, what you're implicitly saying is that by defining them, they define enough exclusion restrictions that the parameter I'm interested in is identified, that it's not confounded in some way. So the, the benefit of drawing a DAG is you're saying, look, I'm saying what things are not related such that I can identify the effect of D on Y, for example. Um, what's written really powerful, I think, in the approach of a research design is the importance of emphasizing you know, what would this be as if it was a randomized experiment? So in many circumstances, we're gonna to get to places where we don't have random experiments. I'm not expecting most of you to necessarily run a random experiment, but you can describe it as if it were. And in many of the uh, tools that we're gonna use, the inference is going to be pretending as if it was approximated by a random experiment. And, um, sorry. Um, Kind of the key here is you really want to be explicit in this. You know, it's not enough. I'm going to come back to this at the end, but being transparent in this is part of the reason why this has been so powerful and, and improved the credibility is by saying, look, I'm expect I'm looking at the way that X causes Y. And rather than trying to control for a number of things, I'm making a constructive argument about the way that X is being um, exogenously manipulated. Any questions on that? Okay, so what we're gonna talk about now for the rest of today is kind of why was this research design re design revolution so important and kind of what can you do with it? What does it give you as a perspective of how to think about um, inference and statistical analysis? So for today, we're basically gonna pretend like we have a randomized intervention. So we're gonna ignore the problem of compliance. So by compliance, what I mean by that is we're gonna ignore the idea that I give you a nudge to do so. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll give, I'll randomize Leland into a treatment, but he has to actually comply with the treatment to get the treatment itself. We're just gonna ignore that problem for now. This is what IV effectively deals with. We're gonna ignore the, what does it mean to be quasi-experimental versus experimental? We're just gonna pretend like we have a coin flip doing this. 
all of these issues are deal um, solvable. There, we're going to talk about these things in the design based setting. This paper on the syllabus, this Bowers and Levitt paper actually talks much more directly about them if you're interested in looking um, with regards to what we're doing today. What we're going to do with this, the knowledge of an explicit randomized design is going to give a different way of to approach estimation and testing than what we usually learn in econometrics. So this is going to be what's called design based inference. And it's a really kind of transparent and efficient way of doing testing and estimation that is strictly in the finite sample space. So we're really going to, we don't have to do anything that's model based. We're going to be thinking about strictly no asymptotics required. We're going to be focusing on things within finite sample, which has a lot of very powerful aspects. And then a lot of things that economists like to complain about, um, which we'll talk about as well. This is really today. The goal is to give you all some familiarity in it so that when we approach this later, um, you'll have seen it. And also, I think it will potentially give you some tools um, for your own work potentially to think about. It's really useful. In, this type of approach is really useful in some um, settings. So if you're interested in spillovers or networks or things like this, this is what we're going to talk about um, next week. This type of design based approach can be really powerful relative to model based inference. Okay. So let me give you some notation initially. So remember, in the potential outcomes framework, we have this idea that we can talk about every unit's potential outcome. There's a finite, and now we're going to talk about, oh, let me turn my G chat off one second. Oh, that's going to be annoying. Um, we're going to talk about um, there being a finite population of individuals. So there's little n individuals. And then for each person, we, uh, we have obviously their two potential outcomes and we have their treatment. We're, we're gonna deal with binary treatments. It's, this is all perfectly extendable to thinking about multi-valued treatments as well. Um, notationally, we're gonna let this bold face vector be the vector of, more generally, if I forget to define this, when things are bold, they typically mean it's the vector. Um, when, and when it's not, or if it's, um, that's typically the individual value. Um, and D zero is gonna be denoting the vector of um, treatment assignments across the N individuals. This is an N by one vector. So the first question is what do we wanna know or test about these outcomes? So there's a lot of things one could be interested in, right? This could be the average, there could be shifts in the distribution, something about an underlying parameter that is maybe economically meaningful. What we're going to focus on today is a simple one. We're going to think about the additive difference. You, there are a lot of things we could do instead of that, but and then we'll think about the average additive difference um, in potential outcome. So this is this is defined as the average in each person's individual outcome. This is the parameter that we're interested in. So this would be right the effect if we treated everyone in the population. This is the average treatment effect. The only distinction here is that. I wrote it here as the sum, but this is actually just equal to the expectation, right? We have a, a population, we could define the expectation as just being um, the probability mass function over each individual. So our estimand is tau bar. The crucial thing, and I'm, I'm gonna belabor this and you should feel free to um, interrupt, but like the thing that is different in a design-based setting is that random variation comes from the random variation in the way that D is distributed across the population. So our outcome variables are fixed. These are known you know, to, to God or to whomever. These are known fixed quantities. They don't change. They're not resampled in any meaningful way. We're fixing those. And instead, what we have is random variation in D which creates the uncertainty in our outcome variables. So this is sort of, this is, if you've only ever seen kind of the traditional way of doing this, where you write Y is equal to something plus epsilon and there's a distribution over epsilon, this can be um, somewhat confusing. But here we're just thinking of these as fixed and now we have random variation in D. So think of omega, omega is a probability space. 
it's the space of possible values that the D vector can take. And it's basically defined this omega space, the probability distribution over that is defined by the type of randomized experiment one runs. So this should be randomized, not randomize. Um, basically, if you do the coin flip example that we talked about at the beginning, where I start with Adlahan and then we go down the line and we flip a coin, then this probability space is just right. There's N of us and then there's just zero one. So the, the full space is just this um, two to the N um, vector where the, it could be either on or off for all N of you and it's all pairwise combinations of it, right? That makes sense. Then the trick of course, with that type of randomized intervention is there can be a lot of variation. So this is just a graph of, think about running a simulation where what I do is I just coin flip for everybody. Well, what can happen is, is on a given draw, you can have a sample where you don't have a lot of people treated um, or, you, or you have too many people treated. It's not, you think of it as being a coin flip, so it's 50-50, but if there's only 10 people, then some of the draws that you're gonna get, only two people or only one person is gonna get treated. And so sometimes there will be other ways that people do um, random assignments. So they'll, you can think of random draws from an urn, which is basically ensures a particular way of being treated. So the way to think about this is now, instead of going through and flipping a coin, I've put everybody um, into, I put basically, I want 50% of the sample treated. And so what I do is I put, there's however many of us, 30 of us. I put 30 balls into an urn, 15, which are red, 15, which are black. What I do now is for every person, as I go down the line, I go in and I draw. If the ball is red, you're treated. And then I take it out and I leave it out. And then I go in again. And this is basically sampling without replacement, right? So what'll happen is I'll get exactly 15, but it will still be randomly assigned. Finally, there are a lot of other interesting ways you can do this, right? And so this is all individual random assignment, but you could cluster on characteristics or on location. Um, there are just ways in which you can randomly sample, but it's not just pure coin flips. There's other ways in which this is done. The key point about this whole design-based inference is everything you do to influence the probability of assignment affects this omega probability space, which then affects your estimator. I find this stuff extremely confusing initially. So it's okay if you do as well, I think. So like, I this is can be challenging relative to what we do in other cases. So, now what we do is we define our research design. So we have a research design typically. So when I was describing it um, previously, the sort of my way of describing a research design, well, we're describing a way in which we think of there being some kind of random assignment to individuals. A randomized treatment is the most obvious one. If I'm coin flipping, then I know everybody's random assignment. So then I know the exact probability distribution over omega, and that should not be Z, that should be D. So um, so we know the probability distribution over the values of D. So first, let's just consider this is a sample of size 10. So N is equal to 10. If we draw, if we have our data, well, remember that YI0 and YI1 are fixed. We just have these fixed values of them. And then we draw the DI. So we have our first five treated here, and then we have our untreated here in the next five. And so what we get is we get our YIs on the right, right? So these guys are treated. And so we get their YI1 values. And for the untreated, we get the YI zeros. This is the assignment that we see in our data. Well, remember, we don't actually see our YI zero, right? We only see the data that we observe. We're just assuming the ca problem of causal, causal inference binds. So what we can do is we know that there were, say if we were gonna enforce that with 50% treated, so it was as if we did this um, earn draw. Well, then we know that there were 252 other potential combinations that could have happened. And this is one of them. Each of them was equally likely. And this was one of those 252. We can now start to talk about the properties of an estimator that uses this data because we know exactly the probability distribution over 
the random variation, which is over D. So what would we use as an estimator? So let's return, let's talk about our estimate of interest. So this, this tau bar, we want basically this estimator, which is summing up over the tau I and takes over N. We basically, it's, it's quite intuitive. We have to propose an estimator, but remember an estimator is the thing you do to get estimates of the estimand. So the estimator here is, we know from thinking about in our other setting that we could take, um, this is identified because we have random assignment. And what we can do is we can take the, the average of the terms that are treated minus the average of the terms that are untreated. So notationally, our empirical estimator is a function of D and Y. And this is vector notation, but hopefully this is clear to you guys that this is just D prime Y is just saying, take the sum over the ones that are treated. One minus D prime Y is saying, saying take the sum over the ones that are control. And then we're dividing by the number treated and we're dividing by the number untreated. So I haven't done anything fancy here. I'm just getting empirical estimates for each one. This object is basically totally well-defined. And the only thing that's random is the D in here. What you can do now, and we're going to do them, we're going to walk through the math of this so you can see it once, is that you can show that this estimator is unbiased under the assumption that the random assignment is equal across omega. So if we just have random assignment and we just sort of equal probabilities across the sample space, then the estimator is unbiased. And what you can do with this estimator is then we can start to talk about tests um, that exploit the, the fact that we know something about D, the probability distri distribution over D. Okay. I wanted to do one example of this because I find it somewhat unintuitive um, personally. Um, so um, basically the way to, to see this is, oh, I'm missing a, mm. so basically we wanna ask, there's, there's three properties we'd be typically interested in um, for an estimator. We wanna know, is it unbiased? We want to know, is it consistent? And typically we want to understand some properties of um, inference over that estimator. Basically, how efficient is it? Um, what you can show is that this estimator is, um, is unbiased. Um, I'm realizing that I have a, a typo in this. So I don't want to make you guys walk through it and then me have to figure out on the fly. Uh, where the typo is. So let's let's come back to it if we have enough if we have enough time. What key point that I want you to know in this is this estimator crucially is unbiased under random assignment being equal over this omega space. And then we can also calculate the variance of um, the estimator over um, the, the variance of this estimator. So uh, that should be Na Naaman, not Newman. Um, it's not Seinfeld. Um, Naaman basically in 1923 defined, you can know the exact variance of this estimator, right? So tau uh, is equal to these three terms. The variance of that estimator is equal to three terms. And this is gonna look familiar um, if you've seen like a simple t-test difference where the variance of tau hat bar is equal to one over n minus one, which is the, this is just accounting for the number of observations. Then it's nt times the variance of the control group over nc. nc times the variance of the treatment group. And then two times the covariance between the um, control outcomes and the, the treatment outcomes. Sigma squared zero and sigma squared one under random assignment are knowable, right? We can just take the same way that we can take the means under random assignment and get expectations. We can do the same thing for the variances. We don't know anything about the covariance. So that requires a knowledge of the joint distribution of the outcomes, which we're never gonna know without model assumptions. So what you do instead is um, you can get a conservative estimate for sigma squared. So basically 
all we need to do is we just need to have a bound on this co covariance term such that sigma hat squared is always greater than sigma squared. So what we can generate is a conservative estimate for this, which is, oh, this should be a one. So n over n minus one of sigma squared zero over nc plus sigma squared one, this should be a one here, over nt. So this is basically taking a weighted average of the variances of the two outcomes, that'll get us the distribution uh, for this term. So what's the payoff? So why, why am I walking you through this other than kind of get you some familiar with the notation? Um, one really useful aspect of this notation is we can think about tests of our estimator. So this is kind of, this is one of the key takeaways that I want you to have here. Consider the following test. So we could be interested in a number of tests, right? So we could, typical tests that we see um, when we do econometrics work is we'll have a test where we wanna test something about our estimator. So our estimator, the, for example, this T bar, we wanna ask, is it, is it equal to zero? And if we reject that, then we sort of feel confident that there's an effect in the population. That's what in the design-based literature you would call a weak hypothesis. It's a, it's a weak null hypothesis in the sense that it's just about a functional of the underlying data. A stronger hypothesis that you can do under this approach is, is to say, well, actually, I think that the effect is zero for everybody. Right, so tau, tau i equals zero obviously implies that tau bar is equal to zero. Right, you can, if the average is equal to zero, then the underlying terms are equal to zero. But what's really valuable about this is that what you, we can use this knowledge and actually do um, a very straightforward test using finite samples to test this. So given our data, so this is our data here, remember, we only observe the YI1s because we only observe for treatment, we never observe the counterfactual. Well, we can do what, this is called a Fisher randomization test. We can ask, we can test this by doing the following. We say, all right, let's impute our missing values under the null hypothesis. So we have YI1 for the treated and we have YI0 for the untreated. Well, once I assert that tau I equals zero for all I, then I know what those values are, right? So that is not very interesting. All I've done is copy and paste the value. Now I'm doing this just for tau i equals zero, but hopefully you notice it could be arbitrary. We could pick, say we had listed everyone in the class in a row. We could have said, well, I think the effect is gonna be blah for X person. It's gonna be blah for Y person. You can imply all sorts of potential outcomes for given people based on their um, characteristics or something else. And that's all exactly testable. So here I've said it's all equal to zero. And now what we're going to do is we're going to randomly permute the treatment labels as a function of our probability design. So we know, for example, what the probability is of seeing certain um, treatment probabilities. Well, we can just generate what the underlying distribution would look like of our estimator under the null hypothesis. And it would look like this. So in this data set, I've sort of done this in this setting. I just took this code. I said, let's take this 10. Then I said, let's impute this. I'll construct the true treatment effect. And the true treatment effect was like, was big. It was something like four. Um, take this difference, now randomly permute the labels. And every time I permute the labels, construct that estimand and then get the distribution of it. This black line that's all the way at the end, that's what the true estimate was. And this is what the underlying distribution of it. You can see it's basically centered around zero. Um, what is, so what have we done? We've just made no distributional assumptions, but we've actually managed to generate a way of constructing p-values for this strong hypothesis test of there being no effect in here. The key piece of it is that what happens is as you permute the D, we're generating random variation in this, the only thing that's random in the population. 
and we're reconstructing new whys um, that we would see based off of this. But obviously the differences now are gonna look, the, the average differences are gonna look very different because now for the people who are treated, they'll be treated as controls, but they'll have much higher values than they would have otherwise. We're basically gonna do this in the problem set next week. So you get an example of, um, of doing something like this. The reason this is valuable is that there are some settings in which you have much more complicated inferential problems. You have settings in which you have a ran something that's random and you wanna test the null, but it's very challenging to kind of know the asymptotic test statistic that you have in mind. This way kind of lets you randomly permute and you don't even have to do it for every single um, potential value under omega. You can do it for just a random sample of it and it will still approximate the distribution. This was basically Fisher's um, big insight on using this for doing tests. So what I wanna just point out is, so the estimator we talked about was this unweighted estimator. We talked about this unweighted difference in means. I showed you this one here. Um, this difference in means is unbiased when the sample, when the kind of the probability distribution over D is random. It's not unbiased if there are certain probability distributions that are much more likely than others. So in a randomized experiment, that's quite common that you'll just sort of get equal weighted on certain things. However, there may be other settings where you get um, basically certain, certain parts of the design space are gonna get much more weight than others. So an observational study is one of the more obvious ones where this might happen. And you need to reweight as a result of that. So this is what's called the, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. Um, and Aaron and Middleton have a very nice um, discussion of this in the Journal of Causal Inference. But all this is doing is unlike in the setting of, um, what should we call it, of the equal weighted one that we were doing before, it just reweights the estimate as a function of how likely you are to get the treatment. And the one that we did, this collapses to just being um, equally weighted. And so re this, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator collapses into the simple difference in means that we were just doing. However, in settings where there isn't that, this is gonna upweight certain parts of the probability distribution. And for those of you who are familiar with this, this is just the propensity score. This is effectively the propensity score. So this is what we're gonna talk about next week is that reweighting by the propensity score estimate is gonna be a way that you're gonna be able to um, get consistent estimates even when you don't have equal um, randomization across the probability space. Okay, so now let's pivot back away from the statistics of this. I think the, the key thing that I want, a lot of this is kind of just setting up notation for next time when we actually talk in an application where um, things are gonna be different. What I wanna talk about now is kind of ending, circling back to where we began, which is, you know, we described that research design and design-based inference was effectively in part a response to this kind of collapse in empirical research in the 1980s. So what's the problem with this? Well, this type of approach, I mean, uh, if you had wanted to complain about it is we were doing this really all fixed in population. I made no statements about kind of what the underlying true parameter is. I said there are N people and I wanna know what the mean effect is on those N people. That's very much like a program evaluation thing. You got hired by the government, they did a treatment and you wanna know what was the effect of, this, of said treatment. In, there's a really strong degree of internal validity there because we randomly assigned, we have, we're really confident in it, but how do we think about external validity in this setting? And this basically, this debate erupted right at the end of the, of the 2000s. It's sort of been going on in the 2000s and sort of came to a head in published work at the end of the 2000s, where this was particularly emphasized on development. So um, Estudio Flo, Abhijit Banerjee and Michael Kremer just won a Nobel prize for this, but this was really kind of contentious during the 2000s where you can tell a little bit from the name of the, the titles, but um, you know, there are these papers, Instruments, Randomizations, and Learning About Development by Deaton, Comparing IV with Structural Models, What IV Can and Cannot Define, Better Late Than Nothing, Building Bridges Between Structural and Program Evaluations, 
Um, a lot of this was tied to instrumental variables, but not exclusively. And so we're, when we get to instrumental variables, we're going to talk a lot about this. But I just want you to kind of be aware of the big complaints here. So Angus Deaton has been kind of leading the charge in the development space of um, complaining a lot about randomization. And this is a quote from his paper um, in the Journal of Empiric of uh, economic literature, where he says in section four of this paper, I'll argue that under ideal circumstances, randomized evaluations are useful for obtaining convincing estimate of the average effect of a program or project. The price for this success is a focus that is too narrow and too local to tell us what works in development, to design policy, to advance scientific knowledge about development processes. Project evaluations, whether using randomized controlled trials, non-experimental methods, are unlikely to disclose the secrets of development, nor, unless they're guided by theory that itself is open to revision, are unlike, they are unlikely to be a basis for a cumulative research program that might lead to better understanding of development. So I would say you can mark them up for a no under RCTs, wanting to run an experiment. Um, this is from Jim Heckman. He has this uh, paper in the same JEL issue where he's really saying, look, you can't use the name in room and framework to do evaluation. It's or you can use it, but it's not nearly as good as using a structural framework. In particular, he advocates um, for thinking about things in terms of a Roy model. Um, and his argument is that, look, a lot of the thing, there are some things that the, the room and framework is really good for thinking about counterfactuals, um, thinking about internal validity. But as you can see, there's a lot of things that he views the Rubin framework as being bad at that if you just did stuff in a structural framework, you'd be a lot more successful. Um, you know, I just want to I quickly highlight before I kind of conclude on this is that, first of all, this table isn't even strictly right. This is just wrong, at least in terms of like ways that you can use this framework. The, the, there are three that definitely are doable under the Rubin framework. Thinking about social interactions and contagion is very doable. Um, thinking about forecasting the effects of new policies, distributional treatment effects is, is doable, et cetera. There are models for the cause of the potential outcomes. These are definitely doable. Um, structural framework can be very valuable for this, but you know, caveat emptor, as you might imagine, the person who wrote this paper is pro-structural framework. So, um, it's just, it is worth highlighting though that, you know, having a model is really valuable in this. And, you know, what's the problem that they're complaining about? Many of the complaints by these sort of what I would call anti-randomistas devolve into three types of complaints. So the first is that they're just done incorrectly. So bad IVs. This is the kind of the thing that um, Deaton spends a lot of time complaining about. Frankly, this is not a particularly interesting complaint. That's like saying people do bad research and that's bad. So yes, bad research should be re rejected regardless. And what's valuable about kind of the research design approach is that the transparency of design makes it easier. You know, if you do something where it's very unclear of exactly how you're generating the variation that you're interested in, that makes it particularly hard to evaluate the work. And just all it does is create uncertainty. It doesn't add any sort of credibility. Two, this idea of the inability to generalize to other populations, you know, this is this complaint, for example, um, that uh, Heckman uses that there's a program called Progressa, which is a ca conditional cash transfer program in Mexico, where they randomize the rollout in order to evaluate its effectiveness. And, you know, this is viewed as a big success in this literature and has led to the growth in other places. Um, that the question is, is you know, how are you supposed to know whether or not Progressa works in other places if you don't know anything about the institutions that work in these other places? You know, Mexico is a very particular country. Maybe there are particular things that work there versus others. Um, and then finally, the third complaint is there's a rhetorical over-reliance on RCTs as the gold standard. There are many post-hoc anal post analyses without a pre-analysis plan that defeat the underlying value of an RCT anyway. This was... Um, the comment that we we just talked about a little while ago right was this idea of well fine you do an rc daniel is bringing this up it's like well you do this but then you do a bunch of analyses afterwards like you can't talk about it being the gold standard if you just run a million regressions afterwards anyway um 
the basically, I think a lot of this summarizes into the idea that the focus on RCTs and IVs causes an overfocus on irrelevant and unimportant questions. And so a briefcase full of results that are not ec economically useful. So, you know, my take on this to kind of wrap this up is, and I'm certainly biased as I'm obviously advocating for a research environment. Um, and my advisor is Hito Imben. So I'm obviously, you know, in pro on this camp. Basically, you know, first, especially in the modern era now in 2021, the concerns about empirics being too separated from models is just an overstated comment. You know, it perhaps in part because people responded to these critiques, but also because there are smart economists working on this, many empirical papers have theoretical models in them to, that either use these causal estimates as a way of kind of evaluating the policies or doing um, broader questions of external validity. And even when you don't, so I do a lot of work that's just purely um, empirical, those empirical papers inform theoretical papers that try and understand the external validity. It, it, it's wrong to say that empirical results are in a vacuum, not usable for others because they help influence theoretical work or other types of work that we do subsequently. I think part of the problem has been this view that every paper has to solve something. Whereas if you contrast this to the science literature, you know, there's a there's an idea of building on subsequent credible research allows for the idea that we can build on each other's research rather than the idea that I have to prove everything all at once in my one paper. Um, being credible kind of helps for this. And a push to open data has actually made it for researchers to follow up and study um, these types of concerns. The second thing is that the concern about how to do empirical work doesn't do much to provide a counterfactual in, in the sense of what are you supposed to do instead? So what's the counterfactual of counterfactuals? Angus Deaton basically complains about randomized experiments and then puts up a ton of observational studies that, you know, all this, the Ed Lemer critiques um, would hold just as uh, validly. So I think it's really, it's, it's challenging in the current environment to forget how bad empirical work was or how um, non-credible people found empirical work in the 1980s, but things were not always great to be an empiricist because it was very challenging to convince people of something that was going on um, prior to this. And so it's not, unless somebody kind of defines a really great counter argument, it's important that these research, research design at a minimum provides a really great way of being credi credible. And the kind of the last thing that I will say, and this has come from a lot of my work on doing stuff with Bardic instruments, for example, the inclusion of an economic model doesn't give an empirical research the ability to omit a research design from their empirics. So just because you write down a model that justifies something doesn't mean you then get to run the regression that comes from the model. To sort of quote Leland's version of this, you know, specifying the distribution of things going on is fine, but you then have to claim that that is the way that the world works if you want it to be true, which I think if you push a lot of theorists on their models, they're not gonna say that this is the way that the world works. So, you know, you can demonstrate that your model is consistent with observational data, but, you know, that's an ex that technically is an implicit research design and one should make it explicit on like why we think that there's causal variation in X that, or variation in X that will allow us to identify the causal effect of X on Y. Um, so with that, I am going to stop. Um, does anyone have any questions 